So I welcome you all who are joining us for this talk this evening on the first fatality of the land war, Philip Meehan, 1845 to 1880. Philip Meehan was a tenant farmer from the townland of Curlie and Beg uh, in County Cavan, near Banlamore in County Leitrim. And he was shot dead by a young landlord uh, from County Roscommon on the 14th of June, 1880. So this talk this evening is an attempt to flesh out the information as it was about uh, Philip Meehan, about uh, who he was, uh, how he died, and about some of the things that happened uh, after uh, his death as well. Uh, so I welcome all of you uh, who are joining us uh, this evening, and a special welcome to the descendants of Philip Meehan, who are joining us for this uh, talk from the United States in America. All of Philip Meehan's descendants are living in various parts of the United States, so we welcome all of them, particularly at this evening. This researching and writing this talk has been uh, a challenge for me because even though I've been researching and writing history for about 40 years now, this one has been particularly challenging. And the reason it has been challenging is that Philip Meehan was a great grand uncle of mine. And it is more difficult, I think, to write and to be objective about uh, and um, um, uh, about somebody who is a family connection. Uh, also, his brother, John Meehan, my great grandfather, was along with Philip when he was shot in 1880, and he was subsequently jailed for unlawful assembly on that day. So there's a strong family connection. And in a way, I had to distance myself a bit and yet the other, as it was, advantage was that I learned quite a lot about Philip Meehan from family over the years, particularly from my grandmother, Susan Meehan, who lived with us until I was 14 years of age. These are my grandparents here on the left-hand side, uh, Francis Kelly and Susan Meehan, for it was taken shortly before they were married, probably in the year 1915. And this is my grandmother, Susan Meehan, uh, much as I remember her, uh, she died in 1966, and I say she was the one who talked regularly about her uncle, uh, who was shot dead, and also about her father, who uh, was jailed for unlawful assembly on that same occasion. Just to explain the family connection a small bit more, um, my great-great-grandparents were Johnny Meehan and Judy McGorn. They lived in the townland of Corleachan Beg, and they had... Uh, you can, this is their family here, Anne, Mary, Catherine, John, Philip, and Bridget. Uh, and um, John and Philip, I suppose, are the two that we will be dealing with mostly uh, in this talk. Philip, I say, who uh, was shot dead, and John, who was jailed. Um, Philip married Bridget Mataviti. She was from the uh, townland of Curla and the, uh, in County Cavan. They were married on the 16th of June, 1873. And John, my great grandfather, married Bridget Dolan in Anna uh, uh, some just months later on the 6th of August, 1873. This here on the left hand side is a picture of my great grandfather and great grandmother, uh, John and Bridget Meehan, probably taken about 1905, shortly before John, uh, John Meehan died. But the ones that were focusing on mostly was Philip and Bridget Meehan. Um, uh, as a, uh, they uh, uh, were married and living in Corley and Beg, and they had three young children um, when um, John, when uh, Philip was shot. John, who was born in 1874, he was just uh, uh, five years old when his father was died. Susie was even less; she was just four, and Annie was just months old. She was born in January 1880. So. Uh, Bridget was left a widow with three young children when her husband, Philip, was shot. This is a map of Ireland, particularly for those, as suppose, who are not familiar uh, with the detail of the country, those from the United States. And this is shown the, where in the northwest of Ireland, uh, on the cavan Leitrim border, this is County Cavan, this is County Leitrim, that this is where the action took place, where Philip was born, lived and died. This is a more detailed map, uh, maybe more useful to those who are familiar with the territory. 
This is the town of Banlamore here in County Leitrim. And this here is the road out by Ochtara Cemetery, out and as far as Camel Lake, and then uh, turn right and uh, heading towards Coralichan. If we go up here, we will see the town land of Coralichan Beg. And this here is the county boundary between County Cavan and County Leitrim. And we'll see that Coralichan Beg is a town land jutting into uh, County Leitrim and the last town land in Cavan uh, from this area. Crowley and Beg was cut off from the rest of Cavan in a way because the mountain of Ben Brack is up immediately be behind it here. So um, Ben Brack uh, up there. Uh, so Crowley and Beg looked more towards Leitrim and towards Banlamore as its hinterland. Here at B shows us the town land of Drum Crumman. And this is where the action took place. What happened was that a family had been evicted from there the year before, my take family, and um, the young landlord, Henry Atkinson, came to fence in the farm and a standoff with a large crowd happened here. The landlord was chased along the road uh, towards Banlamore with a crowd following him and Philip Meekin and John Meekin uh, and literally hundreds of others were chasing them along the road. Uh, the chase took place along this road for a mile or so when uh, Henry B. Atkinson turned round, fired three shots, one of which hit Philip Meehan, and he died uh, so about eight hours later. And he died in here in the townland of Clogher, marked by D. He died in the house here of Patrick Pryor, where he had the man he had been working for uh, earlier that day before all the action took place. So that situates roughly where the action happened in uh, Cavan and Leitrim. To get, give you an idea of what things were like in Ireland at that time, this time, and particularly uh, in the northwest of Ireland, um, virtually all of the land was owned by large landlords, and the people who worked the land were tenant farmers with small plots of land, and they had to pay rent to the landlord, and um, they were evicted if they couldn't uh, uh, manage to pay that rent. So there were tenant farmers were living on the verge of want all the time, and things got particularly bad in the last years of the 1870s, particularly 1877, 78, and 79, because the weather was bad in all of those three years, particularly in 1879, with the result that in the Northwest, there were famine conditions once more. The Great Famine had taken place a generation earlier in the 1840s, and the great fear now was that those conditions would return and that there would be wholesale death as there had been in the 1840s. I should say that these images that I'm shown with these slides, none of them relate to County Leitrim or to the happenings that are, they, there are these uh, Graphics are taken mostly from English newspapers of the time, and also I use some of the artwork at the time. This here uh, on the left is an image of um, policemen and landlord placing an eviction notice on a, a, a cabin door. And on the right, we have this wonderful painting by uh, uh, Henry Jones Thaddeus, um, who painted this eviction scene in 1889 from the inside of the cabin, uh, show, in other words, getting our sympathy in that from the people indoor as a policeman uh, and uh, breaks down the door, uh, preparing to evict them from their house. So it was a time of great poverty and distress, and the uh, farm tenant farmers, like Philip Meehan, were in a bad way and were afraid of starvation and famine setting in once more. So it's against this, uh, the land war started then in the autumn of 1879, when uh, farmers began to get organized, mainly due to people like Michael Davitt, uh, began to get organized and to resist the landlords in their attempt to evict them from their homesteads. This is the, what the, day, let's say, the trigger for the events of the 14th of June, uh, 1880. First is that back in April, 1879, Peter McTagg, together with his wife and a young family, they were evicted from their farm in Drumcrumman in County Leitrim. Uh, 
Then the following year, on the 1st of June, Henry B. Atkinson, this young farmer from, or young landlord from Crohan in County Roscommon, he came with one or two workmen trying to fence in the farm, hoping to be able to lease it or to use it for his own use uh, in the future. There was great resentment because uh, the family had been evicted from the farm, and so he was driven away uh, by a crowd that gathered on that 1st of June, 1880. Undeterred, he planned for another attempt to uh, fence in the farm. He went and bought a revolver in Boyle, County Roscommon, uh, in early June, uh, and then uh, arranged that he would have seven workmen and a large um, uh, consignment of RIC policemen, armed policemen, and that they would return and fence in the farm. And they planned all of this for Monday, the 14th of June, 1880. I should say that one of the big shocks that I got when I was researching this was to discover that Henry Berryhill Atkinson, the landlord, was only 20 years old when all of these events took place. Um, also, just this image here is of the Bandamore detachment of the RIC taken uh, 12 years after the events uh, of uh, June uh, 1880. And you can see that they're an armed force and um, uh, uh, they were supplemented by uh, RIC men from other police stations as well. So uh, my guess is that Henry Atkinson was convinced that he would be able to carry out the fencing in of the farm uh, with himself being armed and with having 16 armed policemen along with him. This is where Henry B. Atkinson came from. He came from Lugnish Amor House in Crohan uh, in County Roscommon. Uh, they were uh, landlords there, had some very good land. And yet this house, uh, this is a picture of the house taken uh, in um, 2021. And you can see that it's not a huge house uh, when we can compare it with other landlords' house at the time. And yet, compared to the cabins that the people like uh, Philip uh, Meehan lived in, it's a mansion and one of immense wealth. So this is where Henry B. Atkinson lived uh, with his uh, mother and other members of the family. His father had died a short time before that. They arranged to come to Leitrim on the, on the Monday, the 14th of June, 1880. And they arrived, the, um, uh, Henry Atkinson with his workmen, on two horse-drawn carriages, and uh, about seven workmen, and then they collected the policemen in Ballymore and headed out to John Cromman to and began fencing in the farm uh, at about 10 a.m. in the morning. Word spread very quickly that uh, what was happening, and a large crowd gathered very quickly. The weather was very good. A lot of the local farmers, tenant farmers, were working on nearby bog, and so they heard all of the uh, commotion, and the crowd gathered, and gathered very mostly with the tools that they had been working with on the bog, with um, spades and with grapes and slands, um, and they gathered to try and prevent the fencing in of the farm taking place. The head constable, Patrick Milmo, he had a panic debate, and yet others would say that he handled the situation quite well. As the crowd gathered and began to surround the landlord and his workmen, the policemen, first of all, loaded their rifles, and later then, Milmo ordered them to unload them. And this action probably saved lots of lives, including the lives of his own policemen on that day. So a standoff for about an hour or so, and rising tension and anger between the crowd and the landlord and, and his, his workmen. What triggered off uh, the event was that at about 12 noon, one of the uh, people gathered there, a man reported that Henry Atkinson was grinning at him and taunting him with his revolver. And once this uh, news spread, all hell broke loose. The police were surrounded. Uh, Henry Atkinson was hit with stones and with uh, the, the grape before he decided to jump from the field and to run down the road towards Baltimore. 
and immediately the crowd followed him. The chase continued along the road, angry crowds of men and women armed with grapes and spades and stones and slands. They chased the landlord and the policemen were running in the middle of the crowd, in the midst of the crowd, trying to catch up with the landlord as well and to protect him. Henry Atkinson ran for about a mile down the road. He was 20 years of age, so he was young and rather fit. Uh, and he was chased by the crowd with Philip and John Meehan, the two brothers. They were to the front of the crowd chasing him. Probably uh, after about a mile of a chase, all of them were getting out of breath and tired. And the landlord turned around and he fired three shots at the crowd that was following him. Uh, and one of these shots uh, hits Philip Meehan in the chest. He staggers and falls to the ground. This is what John Meehan, my great grandfather, what he says about the events of that day. This is John Meehan pictured here. And this here is the ruins of his house uh, in Coralihan Beg, uh, which remain. Both brothers lived near each other in the same town land of Coralihan Beg. John Meehan, given evidence afterwards, stated that he was one of the party who went to the farm. He said he wouldn't have gone, only that his brother, who was blind of one eye, had gone. Uh, he saw his brother, while at the farm, punching Mr. Atkinson with a stick. He pushed his brother away and told him to go home out of that. So this was the older brother trying to uh, protect, I suppose, and um, uh, his younger brother from getting involved. John Meehan gave further evidence stating that he ran along the road just behind his brother, and he said that neither he nor his brother had any intention of injuring uh, Atkinson, but that the landlord turned around and fired three shots. And then John Meehan uh, added, he says, my brother fell after the third shot into a ditch. I ran down and said, oh, Phil, you are dead. And he made a motion to me. I then ran away and got a priest and doctor. This painting here is, uh, was made by Henry Jones Thaddeus, the Cork artist, just one year after um, Philip Meehan was shot. So after the shooting, um, Philip Meehan was brought to the house of Patrick Morn in Clogher, and it was there that the doctor and priest attended him. He died at about quarter past nine on that evening of the 14th of June, 1880 more than eight hours after he was shot. So after his death, his body, as he was brought back to his home in Coralicum. Just to, the, there is no, none of the remains of his house in Coralicum survive, but this is the iron gate uh, that was part of on the entrance into the house. And it, I say, I found this rather moving that the gate has survived. And this is a picture that I took of it uh, back some months ago. This is the, uh, an account of the priest who attended um, uh, Philip Meehan. It's by Michael Fee, and my guess is that Michael Fee was present on the day and that this is a first-hand account. He says that Father Patrick Clark, the curate in Anishilin, there was no priest in Ballinamore. They were all away on retreat in Cavan. So when John Meehan went into Ballinamore to get a priest, he had to then run out to Anishilin and get one there. So this is the description of what Father Clark, Father Patrick Clark did. He said, he, Michael Fee says, he got up on his horse and rode off. The people went to open the gates for him, but he shouted, rid the road, rid the road, the man is dying. He made the horse jump every gate and hedge till he came to where Phil was. He heard his confession and anointed him. And in a few hours, he died. So this is evidence from the doctor, the medical doctor who attended him. Uh, Dr. Patrick Mulcahy, a Limerick man who was doctor in Bandamore. He stated that on the Monday the 14th instant, between one and two o'clock in the afternoon, I saw Philip Meehan alive. He was then in a dying state, suffering from the effects of a pistol shot wound inflicted about three inches below the apex of the heart, but more to the medium night line. The next time I saw him was about nine o'clock that night. At a quarter past the hour, he died. On the 16th instant, I carried out a post-mortem resulting from the hemorrhage caused by the wound. So Philip Meehan was shot, as he was a single shot. 
there was no external bleeding at all. But when Philip Meehan, uh, when the post-mortem was carried out, they discovered that there was a lot of blood uh, uh, had gathered uh, inside in his body. He had bled internally. And when the post-mortem was held, it was held in the house in Coralian Beg. So this must have been quite distressing for his wife and children and everybody else there, that the post-mortem was carried out in the house and that the post-mortem released a lot of blood uh, in the house where he was being waked. This is an account of from a local newspaper, the Sligo Champion, uh, who uh, one of their journalists uh, visited the house. He wrote, at this house, a sad sight was witnessed. His little homestead was crowded by his friends, mostly women who were weeping bitterly. The smell of blood was observed even outside the place. He was married and leaves a wife and three children. A short and yet moving account of the wake and the post-mortem uh, there in the house. So that's Philip, uh, uh, Sir Philip uh, Meehan was buried uh, afterwards uh, in the funeral mass took place in Coralihan and he was buried in Orthra Cemetery. Henry Atkinson, the landlord, after he had shot the uh, Philip Meehan, um, he was lucky because two policemen managed to get one of the horses and uh, traps or uh, car carriages and caught up with them. And they took him onto the carriage and they raced to Banlamore uh, to save him from the crowd. He was held overnight in Banlamore police station and it, then he was taken to Carrick Jail, mostly for his own protection because feelings were running so high in the county. And then the following Saturday, on the 19th of June, five days after the shooting, uh, he was brought to Banlamore for a court hearing. And uh, there were, the police were so afraid of trouble along the way that they brought him in the middle of the night uh, with a huge police escort and didn't bring him the direct route from Banlamore to Carrick and Shannon. Rather, they brought him through Mohol, hoping that they would avoid trouble along the way. And they did get him into Banlamore, um, into the um, courthouse. They managed to get him there safely early in the morning of the 19th of June. They, uh, there was just a brief hearing there, and uh, uh, he was further remanded in jail uh, to be brought to court uh, on the following Monday. The police brought him back to Carrick and Shannon, uh, again with huge escort, and when, he, when they arrived in Carrick and Shannon, a riot erupted. A member of the Leitrim militia, a cousin of Philip Meehan's, uh, threw a stone into the carriage to hit uh, Atkinson as they were passing through the town. The, with the result that there was a whole scale riot and standoff between the Leitrim militia members and the members of the RIC. Uh, so uh, feelings were running very high uh, right throughout the county, or indeed through the two counties of Leitrim and Roscommon. Henry Atkinson was brought again before the court uh, on Monday, the 21st of June. This time they didn't risk bringing him to Banlamore. Instead, he was tried or, or he was brought before the court, uh, this time in Carrick and Shannon, uh, because uh, it was beside the jail where he was being heard. He was, it was expected that he would be charged with manslaughter rather than murder, and that his defence would be that he acted in self-defence. There was a packed jury, but no Catholics were allowed onto it, and there were virtually all of the landed gentry class, those who were on the jury, and they uh, decreed that Henry Atkinson should not stand trial at all for the shooting of Philip McGinn. So this angered people, um, the tenant farmers, that, um, that uh, uh, Atkinson was not charged at all. Um, and chances are that he would have uh, been acquitted if he had been charged of manslaughter, but he actually didn't stand trial at all. He married his first, his cousin, uh, Mary uh, Atkinson from 
uh, also from Crohan, and they lived at Dugnishamar House, and um, they, these are the headstones from Henry Berryhill Atkinson, died young enough man, um, and he died in 1909 when he was just uh, aged 49 years, and he was buried in the lovely Easter Snow uh, Cemetery just outside Crohan. This is the, his headstone here on the left, uh, and this here is then the family one, which is beside it. Uh, this is Henry Berryhill Atkinson, the landlord. He died um, uh, the 22nd of August, 1909, aged 49 years. His wife, Mary, outlived him by quite a long time, by 20 years, and she uh, died in Belfast. This is their son, Henry Bill Atkinson, who also lived at Dugnashamer before moving to uh, County Wicklow. And he also died a young man, dying and the 11th of December 1914, aged just 32 years. His wife, Ellen Jane, uh, uh, lived until 1964, when she died uh, aged uh, 76. I should say at this stage that in all of the recounting of the shooting uh, that I would have heard uh, from my grandmother and other family members, that there was very little anger or resentment towards Henry Berryhill Atkinson. I think uh, what the family focused on was on the sadness uh, and the trauma that was caused to uh, Philip Meehan and his family, but also to John Meehan and his family, because they, they suffered uh, because of all of this as well. So that was the focus on, was rather on uh, the impact that this shooting had, rather than resentment or hatred uh, towards uh, the man who had fired the fatal shot. I was mentioned that there was anger uh, towards um, uh, the judiciary and um, because uh, Henry Atkinson didn't stand trial at all. That anger was added to when uh, some of the tenant farmers who were uh, identified as being present uh, at Drumcrumman on the day that Philip Meehan was shot, some of them were taken to court and charged with unlawful assembly. And we have to contrast the failure to bring Henry Atkinson to trial at all with the determination of the judiciary to uh, try these men because they were, were tried first on the 23rd of June, 1880 in Balnamore uh, and the jury failed to reach a verdict. They were brought to court in Galway in the hope that uh, a Galway jury would convict them. That took place on the 11th of December, 1880 and again, the jury in Galway failed to convict them again. The third time that they were brought to court was on the 8th of March, 1881, uh, about 10 months after the shooting. This time it took place in Carrick and Shannon, and they, were, they made sure that there was a packed jury, and uh, with the result that uh, three men, John Doran, John Meehan, my great-grandfather, and Patrick Degnan were convicted of unlawful assembly. And John Meehan, was uh, sentenced to two months in jail and sureties of 80 pounds on, on release. So uh, they were got, uh, they got um, fined what was considerable amount of money at the time. We consider that most families, their income for a whole year was less than 40 pounds at this time. So this is an income for two years that John Meehan had to, and the others had to pay. And also as they had been jailed for two months. So uh, that they were released then uh, in uh, May in 1881. So Libyan's wife, Bridget, and the three children were left uh, in a bad state uh, in Corleehan Beg. Not only had uh, Philip uh, been shot dead, but also he was the breadwinner and their uh, desperate plight was even more desperate. Uh, because of that. So five years after, or almost five years after the shooting, Bridget uh, made the brave decision to um, uh, emigrate to the United States. So she, who was just only 29 at the time, she brought her three children, John, who was then aged 10 and a half, Susie, who was nine, and Annie, who was five. They, four of them, emigrated on this ship, the Rutruria. Uh, which uh, they went on its maiden voyage. Uh, it sailed from Cove on the 26th of April, 1885. 
they went um, in steerage along with about 800 other people. And you, uh, that was just in the, the third class uh, section of the ship. So a huge number of uh, people emigrating uh, to the United States at this time. And they arrived in New York on the 4th of May, 1885, and they settled in Philadelphia. The um, family tradition is that uh, they went to uh, relations who lived in Philadelphia. So this is a picture of Susie Meehan in, uh, there on the left-hand side there in her later years. She was only three and a half, as I say, when her father was shot dead. This here is Annie Meehan, and she was just five months old when her father was shot dead. We haven't any picture of John Meehan, the son of Philip, but we have this picture here of John's grandson, uh, Philip Meehan, who um, um, was, um, his father John was just, I say, six years old when, when his father was shot. So um, these are descendants of um, Philip and Bridget Meehan, and who lived in the United States. And I say there are literally hundreds of their descendants now living in various parts of the United States, some of whom have joined in for this talk at this evening. Bridget Meehan was a survivor and in many ways the heroine of this whole story because she managed to take care of her family and to raise them uh, uh, to adulthood. And uh, she married twice more. She married Edward Murphy in 1887 and they had one son um, uh, uh, and she also married, uh, after Edward died, she married Peter Tracy in 1891. She outlived all three of her husbands and she died on the 4th of December, 1923. And in many ways, I think this Bridget Meehan, Bridget, formerly Bridget McAviti of Corda, she was a survivor and had a tough life and yet managed somehow to raise a great family. The American connection has been very important for my research in all of this. Um, and um, uh, I am very grateful to Marianne Raman. This is Marianne here, uh, who is a great, great granddaughter of Philip and uh, Bridget Meehan's. And Marianne visited Ireland about three times, I think, maybe first about the year um, in the early 2000s, uh, and I think the last time in 2010. And she and my father, my late father, who died in 2016, they kept up a correspondence. And that I got information from Marianne from the American side of the family. And I'm very grateful to her and to Rosemary Lambsback as well for information and photographs um, from the United States. I'm also grateful to my brother, Frankie, who lives in North Carolina, because he uh, unearthed for uh, the, a lot of the American documents, birth certificates and um, things like that for of the Meehan family in the United States. So we're nearly there. This here is a picture of Joy Servana, a great, great, great grandson of Philip Meehan's. And this is a picture of him taken last summer uh, by the pool, reading my book on Philip Meehan, his great, great, great grandfather. And this is some of the joys that you get as a historian to see the, that you can uh, give information and uh, make available the story of uh, the past uh, for people in the present day. And hopefully that this, I say, will um, continue to be uh, of interest to it. The book has it, it's been published and, uh, say, has been launched um, uh, shortly. So it, it will be on sale. But I say it's one of the great joys that I've been able to make this information available for uh, Henry or for um, Philip Meehan's uh, family descendants in the United States, but also for John Meehan, my great great my great grandfather's descendants. There are literally hundreds of them here in Ireland as well. So I've been able to make this information available for them. So that's briefly the story of Philip Meehan. I say there's more detail in the book, uh, The First Fatality of the Land War, uh, Philip Meehan, uh, 1845 to 1880. Just to finish by saying thanks to you for joining us this evening on this talk. Hopefully it's of some uh, that you learn from it and that it's of some interest to you. I want to say a special word of thanks to the Common Shankis Brefney, the Brefney Historical Society, 
and to the Johnson Library in Cavan uh, for hosting this lecture and to Brendan Scott for uh, scheduling it uh, here in, in November. So again, thanks for joining us. And as I say, if you need to get more information, uh, then it's available in the book, which will be published shortly. Thank you. Thank you.